and welcome to Spencer's Library. I'm Claudia and today I'm reviewing A Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers. A while ago I put out a tweet asking for sort of optimistic, solar punk, positive futuristic book recommendations and this book was one that was mentioned. I have previously read Becky Chambers' first Wayfarer's book and really loved that, so I thought, hey, maybe this is exactly the comfort read that I need. A Psalm for the Wild Build is set in a futuristic world in which one single event long in the past has shaped society for the better. And that was the event of robots gaining consciousness and leaving the factories for the wild. And humans who had originally built and designed these AI, these robots, just let them go. Centuries later, when our story begins, a young monk named Dex leaves the safety and predictability of their life as a garden monk to move out of the city and become a tea monk. So first they travel out of the city into the surrounding villages with what's essentially a bicycle-powered camper van and they offer tea and uh, a sympathetic ear to the villagers, which is what the job of a tea monk is, apparently. But after a few years, that's just not enough for them. So they actually move out of the villages into true wilderness. And that's where Dex encounters Moscap, who is a robot very curious about human life and human society. The humans and robots have not had any contact for centuries and these two individuals are the first of their respective species or type of creature to meet each other. Dex and Moscap connect and move through the wilderness together on the hunt for a faraway retreat. And on the way there they have long conversations about the meaning of existence. This is as much as I want to tell you about the actual plot of the book. This is a very short story. I read it in two sittings. I read it as an ebook, so I don't know how many pages it has as a paper book, but I would expect it's uh, between 150 and 250 pages. The world building in this is an interesting part of how the story works, because the story is set in a futuristic world that, broadly speaking, works, unlike all of the dystopian novels that we know and love. This is a sustainable and very kind vision of the future, but that unproblematic setting leaves enough narrative space for the philosophical debates in the book that really make up the bulk of the story. And those philosophical debates go into the core of what it means to not just be human, but to exist as a conscious being. The main protagonist, Dex, is not fighting a deadly foe or trying to rectify some big injustice. They are just a person who is unhappy with their life and without really knowing why. The idea, the story trope of a protagonist going through an outward journey into the wild uh, that is then symbolic of a sort of inner struggle, of an inner journey, that's fairly common. We, we recognize that story archetype However, in most of the books that I've read, that outward story, that outward journey is caused by an external trigger. But in this book, the motivation for Dex to leave the city and to travel into the wild is entirely self-motivated. It comes from a deep unhappiness and imbalance in their own mind and soul. And that's what makes this story a little bit different from other sort of travel into the wild books that you might be familiar with. But it is this inner motivation that I thought made this main character really very relatable. I think we've all been in the situation where we felt unhappy about something, but we can't quite articulate it. And Dex's attempt to fight this unhappiness, to do something, anything, even if they didn't quite know what that was, was something I could empathize was something I could was something I could emphasize with while I was reading the book. While Dex is a very familiar sort of protagonist, someone with inner conflict and flaws and a lot of personality, Moscat, the robot, is intriguingly alien. Because being a robot, Moscat functions on a level that is paradoxically both unhuman but also human designed. And I think the author really succeeded in 
creating a character that is uncanny in that sort of way. A lot of the dialogue between Moscap and Dex comes from the idea that Moscap and the way that it thinks about itself and about robots is so different from how humans think. But at the same time, Moscap's reactions are in some way very, very human indeed. For example, there is one scene where Dex talks to Moscap and says, oh, you are not just an object, meaning it is a compliment. And then Moscap gets very offended because it considers itself an object and is comfortable in that identity. And Dex is not respecting that. And Moscap responds and says, well, I am an object and I'm proud of being an object. And you telling me that I'm not an object is actually insulting. So you have this unhuman element. The fact that Moscap considers itself an object and that Moscap considers being an object as something valuable and worth of respect. So that in itself feels very strange, even saying it feels very unhuman. But then the very human element is that it gets offended when someone misidentifies it. When I think of robots in science fiction, I don't often think of robots getting offended. It's this sort of dialogue between the two characters. And I say the two characters because they are literally the only characters in this book. There are, you know, side characters, mentions of, of other people, but really Moscap and Dex are the only two people, robots, entities <laughs> in the book that matter. So it's the dialogue between these two characters that really makes you think about those questions of existence and humanity. Those kind of deep conversations don't often get space in novels because there is usually a more pressing problem, a more pressing plot point to deal with. You know, matters of life and death, of victory or defeat, um, political struggles, interpersonal struggles. There is just none of that in this book. And I found that quite fascinating. This is a novel that functions entirely with two characters and one of them doesn't even get introduced until halfway through the book. So inevitably, it's a very quiet story and you spend a lot of time inside Dex's head and their feelings and their thoughts and their emotions and their motivations. And Becky Chambers' craft as a writer really shines through, especially in that first part. For so much of the book, we only have internal monologue and descriptions of the world and a very gentle, slow, meandering plot. Let's talk about the world building for a bit because I absolutely adored this world. The setting plays with two tropes that I really love as a reader. One of them is the idea of a sort of slow, sustainable, intentional society. And that is where the solar punk element comes into this and why I think this book is going to be hugely popular with people who are invested in the sort of solar punk philosophy and aesthetic, because this is a world that is decidedly apolitical in a way. We don't really get anything about government. We don't really get any injustices, any class struggles, any kind of identity struggles or systemic oppression is just absent from this book, at least when it comes to the human society in it. You get the feeling of a world in which every person is valued for who they are and in which everyone's life is enabled and in which everyone is encouraged to live their best life and contribute according to their own talents. I think just the fact that the main character is a monk really plays into that. Obviously, with Dex being a monk, a lot of their life and a lot of their thoughts are focused on deity and religion. The main character being a monk speaks to the general thoughtfulness of this society. And I really enjoyed that. So layered on this sort of general philosophy of gentleness and kindness and abundance, there is the sustainability layer, if we want to call it that. So Dex rides around on a bicycle. Their previous job was as a garden monk and it seems like the city itself is very 
literally green with a lot of plant life. While there isn't really any talk about governmental structures, there is a decent amount of discussion of how the economy, I guess, works. The city, and there is only one city on this half of the world, is nearly self-sustained and anything that cannot be provided by the city itself is grown in outlying satellite farms which uh, then feed back into the city. So uh, the author clearly thought about how this world could be futuristic while at the same time being slowed down, gentle, calm and sustainable. You know, the author really thought about how to make this an ecologically sustainable world that still reads very futuristic. I love that and I wish we had spent a little bit more time in the city. This is the first book in a series so I expect that we will return to the city in later installments. That was the first of the world building tropes I loved. The sustainable solar punk future. The second trope that I loved in terms of the world building is the wilderness. I love stories in which the protagonist has to survive in the wild. I've uh, talked about this before in my reviews of Circe by Madeleine Miller, um, of Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. I love it when the main character is plopped in the middle of the wilderness and has to figure it out. I just love reading that. Oh, it makes me so happy. In this book, once Dex is out in the wild, they're not really by themselves because they've got Mosscap the robot, uh, both to keep them company, but also as a sort of guide to the wilderness, because uh, the robot is, as the title suggests, wild built. So it knows the wilderness, it knows the plants, the animals and all of the dangers, but it still, it still really hit that spot where I'm like, yes, we have a, a futuristic city half, and we have a wilderness half, and I love both of them equally. The world, the setting, the very sparse plot only really exist to facilitate discussion between the two main characters, as I've already said. And in a way, this reminded me a lot of old-fashioned philosophical essays from the Victorian era and earlier. I don't know if you're familiar with any of those, but for example, Oscar Wilde's essays, where there are always two characters, sometimes three characters, each representing a sort of idea or position or an argument, and then the characters get into dialogue with each other and discuss those ideas. If none of this makes sense to you, do check out some of Oscar Wilde's essays and you'll know what I mean. So instead of writing the essay as a piece of non-fiction writing, um, where you, the author, present two sides of an argument and then you analyze them and you bring them into dialogue, Instead of doing it that way, those old-fashioned essays create fiction around these two ideas. And that's what it felt like reading a psalm for the wild build. And I loved it as that. I really did. It's escapism into a beautifully designed futuristic world, while at the same time making you ponder and think about your own place in the world that we currently occupy. It's no coincidence that the main job of the main character is giving out cups of tea because this book really felt like a nice hot mug of tea. It's warm, it's deeply comforting, with a little bit of bitterness, a little bit of edge. I said I read this in two sittings and actually I did read this with two steaming hot mugs of tea despite the warm July weather. I just felt like that was the perfect pairing for reading this book. If all of this sounds interesting to you, the sort of bare, slow, frankly unexciting plot, the long dialogue about the meaning of being, and the utopian solar punk setting, I'd say get the book, you will love it. But it isn't for everyone, especially not those readers who like their sci-fi exciting, dangerous and dark. I ended up giving this book four stars on Goodreads and the only reason why I didn't give it five stars is that I thought it was too short. In the end, it felt more like a short story than a novel and I would have liked to immerse myself a little bit more into this world if it had been given more room, more detail. Why not make this slow story even slower, even more bare in terms of plot and pad it out with descriptions and more philosophical dialogue. If you're gonna go extreme, go all the way, make it 
more inward looking, more slow paced, more thoughtful even. But overall it was a wonderful read and you will love it if you like this sort of thing. And as it happens I do. I am 100% going to pick up future installments of this series which I believe is very aptly called Monk and Robot and I can't wait to get back to this wonderful futuristic world and to see what Dex and Moscap are up to next. Let me know if you enjoyed this book, if you've read it, it's only just come out. You may not even have heard of it. I definitely hadn't if it hadn't been recommended to me in that tweet. So thank you very much, Harriet, for suggesting this book to me. And thank you all for watching. Bye.